Perfect, George. We can see your screen and your video. Thank you so much. So um, thank you, Elena. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first section of today's webinar, um, COVID-19, Globalization and Philanthropy. And I'm George Ma from SDS in Hong Kong. And I'm also from the Jockey Club Museum of Climate Change from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So before we get started, let me first quickly um, remind you that you will, be, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presentation um, by typing your question in the question pane uh, on the control panel. Then um, you may send in your question at any time during the presentation and we'll collect this and try to address them during the Q&A section after the presentation. We will hear two presentations today. Now, um, COVID-19. So, um, now, today's Earth Day, April 22nd. In Chinese, it is Sei Yi Yi Sab Yi Ho. Sei Yi Yi, 422. Let me do a little bit of trick before we start the presentation. But let me stretch the four and put the two twos in the four, see what happens. Now we get a mask, something we are now very familiar with these days. And some people do wear a mask, some people don't. Now does this have anything to do with our culture or social coordination? Some people say, well, um, controlling the disease has something to do with social um, coordination. And our next speaker, our first speakers will answer. So let me um, introduce um, Professor C.Y. Chiu, um, Chou Menli Professor of Psychology and also Dean of Social Science of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Chiu, please. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Uh, so the, uh, shall I start now? Or I... Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so to, uh, thank you very much for having me here uh, today. To, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the title of my presentation today is Illness, Happiness in Global Context. So next, please. So to, what I plan to do is to like to, uh, talk about three seemingly unrelated concepts, illness, happiness, and globalization. And I shall argue that uh, these three concepts are actually related in some way. So uh, next slide, please. So I'll start with illness. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, this is a, uh, a graph that depicts the changing infection rate of COVID-19 around the world in the last 88 days. Uh, what you can see here is that there are up and downs uh, in the infection rates, but on the whole, uh, uh, we have a rising trend in the infection rates around the world. But fortunately, I think in the past uh, week or two weeks, we see uh, the uh, infection rates start to flatten. Uh, 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 so to, but then you can also compare this figure with the next one. So next slide, please. So next slide, please. And this is the figure from Hong Kong. So what you can see here is that uh, there are similarity and differences between the situation in Hong Kong and around the world. I think the biggest differences is that in the past two weeks, you actually see a big draw uh, in the infection rate in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, next slide, please. If you look at uh, the changing infection rate, around the world, you will see that uh, some countries or entities are doing better than others. So this is a figure that shows the, change, the different rates of infection around uh, uh, the more than 200 entities around the world. Now, most countries are actually doing quite well, but some entities are suffering a lot. So next slide.
So some countries are actually showing the, uh, uh, an accelerating rate of infection. So the, in fact, uh, 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 well, most countries are showing a the accelerating the rate, but there are also some countries or entities showing a decelerating the infection rate. So our question is, which country or entities is doing better than others and why they are doing better than others? So next slide, please. So this is a graph that depicts the infection rates of the different countries uh, as a function of how many days they are into the disease. So, uh, so for example, from this figure, you can see that uh, while um, some countries, particularly those countries in Italy, Spain, the United States, uh, uh, and uh, uh, France and the UK, they have higher infection rates than other countries have the similar number of days into the disease. So those countries that tend to do better are South Korea and Singapore and also entities like Taiwan and Hong Kong. So you may wonder, okay, what contributes to this uh, variations in the infection rates across different entities? So next, way, uh, next slide, please. So this takes us to the Next, uh, the connection between illness and uh, globalization. So next slide, please. If look, you look at this graph, you will see that uh, on the horizontal axis is the extent of globalization of a uh, uh, entity or country. And then on the vertical axis is the infection weight. What you see here is some positive relationship between these two measures, the infection rates and globalization index. Meaning countries that are more globalized tend to have high infection rates. So this pandemic is really related to the extent of globalization of countries or entities. But uh, you, you feel that uh, countries who are more globalized would, ne would necessarily have high infection rates you may want to look at the case of Singapore or uh, like a city like Hong Kong. Despite the fact that they are highly globalized country or entity, well, they actually have relatively low infection rate. So globalization contributes to the uh, increase, the, the acceleration of infection rates around the world, but uh, the relationship is not determined deterministic in the sense that some countries or entities can actually do something to really like contain the spread of the disease despite the, uh, the great extent of uh, globalization in this country of entity. So let's slide this. So you may wonder, so what can individuals do to help contain the spread of the virus? So to, next slide please. Now, what I would like to share with you is a perspective from uh, behavioral economics and psychology. So the experts in public health will tell you that the infection is preventable if you do enough precaution, uh, take in, uh, enough preventive steps. So for example, experts would advise us to wash our hands frequently, uh, like to wear face masks uh, when you go out, avoid social events, uh, maintain social distancing, and so on and so forth. Now, this advice is very sensible, but at the same time, it also creates a dilemma for individuals. Are you telling us that we can no longer go to parties? We can no longer go shopping? No kissing, no hugging, no partying? That sounds terrible from the perspective of like uh, personal freedom and convenience. But at the same time, if everybody can do, can follow this advice, then uh, well, perhaps we have a chance to contain the virus and uh, our individual behavior or action or self-restraint uh, can actually contrib contribute to, uh, to the common good. So this is the dilemma that we face. Shall we put our personal freedom and convenience before the common good, or shall we put the common good 
before personal freedom and convenience. So this slide, please. So in this slide, okay, on the left, you see a photo taken in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, this is actually like uh, a wedding picture. So people here, well, uh, in this picture, well, they are wear the mask even when they're taking photo for their wedding. Now on the right hand side, you see a clip, a clipping from the, uh, from a news report that say, okay, now even though the government in Italy imposed some measures, some uh, 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 taking some steps to contain the virus by asking people to stay home. People, a lot of people refuse to follow the instruction uh, or the law and then they get fined. So they're even willing to like to, uh, pay for the fine and to exercise their personal freedom. So to, uh, this slide, please. This slide, please. So uh, what I want to do is to share with you some research findings from a group of researchers at the University of Cambridge. Well, in mid-March, they surveyed citizens from eight countries that were that were struggling with the uh, the infection, with the COVID-19 infection, and they measure a couple of things that are of interest here. So next slide here. Next slide, please. So one thing that they measure, uh, well, uh, is uh, the number of preventive action that were taken by the citizens. So they have a long list of uh, preventive actions recommended by experts in public health, and they just measure how many different preventive actions were taken by the citizens. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And the second variable that they measure is where the citizens agree that uh, it is okay for the government to interfere in order to protect the common good, even at the expenses of cons Constra constraining the personal freedom of the citizen, or the other way around, whether the uh, personal freedom should be put before the common good and uh, uh, whether the government interference are uh, illegitimate. So the next slide, please. And when you look at the data, in all the eight countries, there is a positive relationship between people believing in the importance of putting common good before personal freedom and uh, the number of preventive behavior they will take. Now, if I uh, uh, this slide, please. In this study, they also asked the respondent one question, and that is whether or not it is important to do things that would benefit others and society, even if they have some cost to, this in, uh, to the individual citizen. And again, what you see here is that in all eight countries, there is a positive relationship in the belief that it is important to, ban to do something to benefit others, even at the cost of the individual and the number of preventive behaviors that people would take. Uh, to stop the uh, to stop the infection. So this night piece. Now those are the data at the individual level. So you may wonder, well, how the data may look, uh, how the situation may look at the country level or entity level. So if you look at uh, the next night. So you see that uh, there are variation in how people in the society, in different society, respond to uh, the virus. So in some places, like uh, uh, some countries in Asia, people willingly wear face masks and uh, engage in other preventive behavior. Willingly. So, to, for example, in my hometown in Hong Kong. So almost everybody would wear a face mask uh, on the, if they go out. 
and uh, you you happen to forget your mask people will remind you to wear your mask if you don't have one some may give you one just to make sure that well uh you are doing something to, that is good for yourself and good for the community but then to, in some other places well engaging in this uh preventive behaviors is contest by some citizens. So you can say that, uh, well, uh, there are some countries that have like a better social coordination than others. So, uh, yep. next slide, please. So in this figure, what I show you is country differences in a variable called individualism. So what is individualism? Individualism is the shared belief that we should put personal goals before the common good. So to, you can see that uh, across uh, different countries, uh, this uh, shared belief is uh, stronger in some countries than in others. So for example, the United States have a really strong belief in individualism, followed by some European countries. And then to, in Asian countries, you see uh, a stronger belief in the collectivism or uh, which is the opposite of individualism so and then to, on the vertical axis of this uh, graph you see the infection weight and what you can see here is that uh, individualist countries or entities tend to have higher infection weights probably because it would be harder to coordinate the action of individuals if individuals in the uh, countries or entity are reluctant to give up their personal freedom uh, or to give up the, the pursuit of their personal goal uh, in order to benefit the collective. So next slide, please. So in short, I think uh, one of the very uh, important lessons we learned from this data is that, uh, well, there could be many factors that contribute to uh, the variation across country in the infection rates but I think the one important factor that we have discovered from this data is that uh, successful contention of the wires at the country level actually requires coordination of our interests, our personal interests, uh, and also to the collective interests. And uh, countries with citizens who are willing to really balance the minimi, uh, their personal goals uh, with the co uh, co uh, collective uh, goal uh, uh, tend to like fare better uh, in uh, this battle against uh, COVID-19. So next slide, please. Now, uh, let me turn to uh, a second concept, happiness, and uh, its relationship with globalization. Next slide, please. So you may wonder, okay, what is happiness? Well, uh, we should tell us that uh, there are many different ways uh, to have happiness, to achieve happiness. This night piece. And uh, one, uh, one way we can get happiness, we can achieve happiness uh, is eudaimonic happiness. Okay, so this is, a, it seems to be a new concept, but this is actually an old concept in philosophy. So what is eudaimonic happiness? Eudaimonic happiness is you gain happiness by seeing that what you're doing has meaning or has a purpose. Now, let me show you some data, uh, cross-cultural data. So next slide, please. So in this picture, what you see is that uh, it's the association between social spending and happiness of the citizens in, the, uh, in, that, in the different countries. So what you can see is that, uh, well, there are actually strong positive relationship between social spending and the general level of happiness in a country, meaning that in a country that uh, have higher level of social spending, people there tend to be happier. Now, when you see uh, a country or entity uh, in green color, that means the relationship is really strong. Uh, if you see a country is in red color, you, that means in this country, you actually see a negative relationship between social spending and happiness. Now, fortunately for our world, most countries are 
in green color, a shade in green color, meaning that post social spending really makes people happy almost everywhere in the world. Next slide, please. Now, this actually takes us to a very interesting concept called uh, give and take, proposed by Adam, Adam Grant. So, in this book, he actually presents very convincing evidence that uh, if you look at uh, people who are successful in the, their uh, business or in their profession, you will find out that uh, well, these people tend to be givers rather than takers. That means being a giver can actually increase your chance of success. Now, why would that be the case? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, research tells us that uh, people are constantly searching for meaning. They ask questions like, where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? And research shows that while people who find answer to these questions tend to be happier. And uh, next slide, please. So who are the people who tend to see their life to be meaningful? Well, uh, there has been some very good research showing that if people tell you that they are a taker instead of a giver, they, they may not feel that their life is very meaningful. However, if they tell you that I'm a giver, there is a much higher chance that uh, they will te also tell you their life is meaningful. If they also tell you that I have the leading, then uh, it is also to, quite likely that they would tell you my life is meaningful. So now, next slide, please. Now, let me try to turn to the last connection, that is illness and happiness. Now, next slide, please. Some research are now telling us that people who find their life to be meaningful tend to be not only happier, but they are also healthier. So there are some, next slide please. Next slide please. Uh, I will not go into details of this, but there are some very good research showing that uh, when people report that their life is meaningful, their email system tend to be stronger. Now, I think in the person context, when we are all trying our way, our best to contain uh, the spread of the disease, well, this is actually good news. The good news is when people are doing some social behaviors in order to help the community to contain the virus, not only would uh, the behavior itself stop or slow down the spread of the infection, but the immune system also tend to be better because they find meaning in what they are doing. So next slide, please. So I'm now ready to go to the conclusion of this presentation. I start by introducing three concepts, illness, happiness, and globalization. Now, I hope you see that uh, they are all connected. Now, what I would like to do uh, in this last slide is to actually show you how they are related. So, next slide, please. Oh, perhaps there's no next slide. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, we do. Okay. So, if we are willing to put the common good ahead of us, we are willing to engage in cooperative behavior at the expense of some physical freedom and convenience at this moment. We are willing to give to the leading. We are going to, we are willing to like to do something for the uh, collective good of the society. Research tells us that we'll be more successful, we'll be happier, we'll find our life more meaningful, and we'll have better health as well. So these are actually personal benefits. 
this would actually help us personally. So you would actually like to make us better or healthier and happier individuals. And uh, these positive feelings would also enable us to engage more in activities that would promote the collective good. Now, I think uh, I should end here because I think the, the next speaker uh, is going to tell us more about uh, uh, how we can actually contribute uh, to the collective good at the organizational level uh, and uh, through this organizational effort actually promotes the creation of a uh, positive culture that is good for everybody and the society. In fact, I think the next uh, speaker himself embodies all these concepts that uh, I present today. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Professor Chiu. Um, let me change the slide. So, um, let me welcome our second speaker, Mr. Leon Zhang, Executive Director, Charity and Community of the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Mr. Chen is also the co-chair of SDS in Hong Kong. Um, he will be sharing with us uh, his vision and, and his uh, ideas on philanthropy responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Mr. Chen, please. Right. <clears throat> thank you, George. And thank you, Professor Chu, for the uh, introduction uh, as well. So very quickly, some background on the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charities Trust. Uh, we are one of the top 10 largest non-government foundation globally uh, in terms of annual giving. Um, so with a crisis like that, obviously there is a lot of uh, expectations uh, being put on various philanthropic organizations around the world. So in the next few minutes, uh, I try to um, uh, share with you what we have done uh, and then also in terms of thinking along the, the dimensions of happiness and sustainability, uh, what else uh, need to be done? Uh, so, George, next slide, please. Right, so this is um, coming out from McKinsey report. Uh, this is really a context of uh, what we're talking about uh, today and perhaps for the next couple of months as well. Uh, on the left, you can see, you know, globally, this is becoming a humanitarian challenge. It's not just one city, one country, one region, but it's a, it is a global challenge uh, right now. But then if you really look uh, in the next granular level of detail, we will see um, the, the virus disproportionately uh, have a bigger impact or more negative impact on the elderly population, on people with uh, chronic health conditions. They are at a greater risk. Uh, next slide, please. And similarly, when different governments uh, and community societies thinking about mitigation measures, uh, including uh, social distancing, or I guess uh, Jeff would prefer physical distancing. But all these measures, uh, closing down schools, quarantines, uh, closing of the public facilities, libraries, uh, recreational areas, or to even extreme uh, lockdown of a city, allowing only you know, uh, selected family members to go out to, to just buy food items. All these measures, mitigation measures, they have, um, you know, uh, has tremendous social economic implications as well. And once again, these measures also disproportionately uh, would affect some people more than others, and mostly the vulnerable groups. So think about in a city whereby the ethnic minorities, they may not be able to, to obtain the first-hand information, uh, as some of the information sometimes are only broadcasted uh, in sort of the, the dominant language. Uh, also think about, you know, parents who then now potentially lose their jobs, uh, but then also need to take care of children who are now, who are now not going to school uh, and think about sort of um, domestic violence, uh, think about all these other vulnerable groups, they are disproportionately affected. Uh, and I think in the initial stage, I think Hong Kong 
we're now, um, you know, luckily, I think we have come down the curve. We've been able to flatten the curve uh, and come to hopefully, you know, more stable, stabilized situation, uh, although we remain vigilant. But for a lot of the uh, places and countries, I think we all went through this phase of despair, this phase of panic, you know, thinking about um, the lack of supply on medical side, thinking about lack of hand sanitizers, uh, even if you look at the picture, thinking about supermarkets running out of food. So panic and anxiety, uh, all these things, uh, along with the challenge on the physical side, uh, all these add to uh, a mental health risk. You can, I think, virtually, imaginarily, think of it almost like a three-way tug of war. So we have, on the infectious disease side, we want to uh, control as much as possible to eliminate or, or reduce the social interactions uh, that it is to protect our physical health. But then on the social emotional side, that create a huge stress uh, on that side. Uh, and then on, the, on the, the third dimension is really then the economic side. So can we sustain a very long term uh, of these sort of measures as an economy? Uh, so what does that do uh, to then uh, the rest of, of the life uh, as well? So next slide, please. So I guess it is in that context, then how do we think about still sort of happiness uh, to society in this very challenging time? And how do we then think even longer term to think about a more sustainable city? Uh, and then what the community can learn from this COVID-19? As much as we are dealing with it, are there any lessons we can already draw and we can already start to build uh, to avoid the next, uh, the next challenge? Now, in thinking about these questions, we, th we feel like you know, there are a few dimensions we need to consider. You know? uh, it is not just about recovery. It is not just long-term planning. A lot of the economies, a lot of the cities, and even in Hong Kong, we're still facing uh, immediate relief issues. So how do you strike a balance between immediate relief uh, and resources and, and time uh, devoted for the longer-term planning? How do we think about resilience, physical and mental health? How do we build capacity for the new normal? You know, we are now, a lot of us are working from home. A lot of us are learning from home. Uh, and all these capacities are going forward. They might not just go away after COVID-19. Some of them will stay. So what are the new normals? Uh, and then also on the medical and healthcare side, uh, we have learned Hong Kong uh, specifically, we have learned a lot of lessons from SARS uh, 17 years ago in 2003. Um, so we built on that you know, that help us to go through this particular challenge. What are the, the lessons that we learn from today? So that would help us uh, in, the, in the next challenge. Next slide, please. And that requires, I think, collaborations uh, among different players, different sectors uh, in the community, right? It is not just the government. Government is very, very important, but it's not just the government. It is also the businesses, also healthcare sectors, the community, uh, the civil society. So it is all of us, you know, like Professor Chu said, it is the, the we that counts. So how do we come together, uh, leave beside, you know, our other controversies, uh, but then work together, you know, on this uh, challenge now and also going forward? How do we build the solidarity uh, among different players uh, in, the so in the society? So next slide, please. So from a philanthropist perspective, uh, this is what we, what we have done and this is what we, what we try to do and, and like to just take the opportunity a couple of minutes to share with you. Uh, by no means, this is uh, all of it and, and by no means we feel like this is, this is it. And I think there are different ideas uh, in the world that all contribute to this effort. So here we're just trying to, to share what we have done uh, under the Hong Kong context. Uh, in a nutshell, we uh, very quickly put about US $25 million to work. Uh, these are, in fact, today is beyond commitment. Uh, in, uh, in a very short, about eight weeks time, we already deployed most of these resources uh, to the community on, on the ground. So put the money to work, you know, very, very critical. And in summary, I would use three words to summarize uh, all of our effort. It is agility, it is empowerment, uh, it is creativity. Right? I mean, agility, extremely important. You know, in situations, in the disaster situations like this, speed uh, is a lot more important uh, sometimes than perfection. So for us, we quickly put together uh, about seven million US dollar 
to purchase um, items that's um, that's um, you know in, in huge demand uh, from the community. So we already distributed out uh, with our hundreds of our partners close to 15 million surgical masks, uh, and then also other items, hand sanitizers, even food, uh, to a lot of the vulnerable groups uh, in Hong Kong. So that's that's agility. You know, put your money to work. Uh, be flexible. Work with your partners. Right, very very important. Now it also leads to second point: empowerment. Right? You can't just dump the money out and hope the money would go, you know, the the proper way to find the vulnerable groups in need. Right. So to us, we have a long history of working with various NGOs uh, in Hong Kong in the city. So that really allow us to very quickly find the right partners. In in, in this case, in eight weeks' time, we already work with uh, close to 200 partners. Uh, we already gave out, you know, out of the 13 million US dollar commitment, we already gave out more than 10 million uh, into the hands of the partners so that they can then go on to help the very specific uh, vulnerable groups uh, in the community. So those include ethnic minorities, uh, those include uh, cross-border uh, students, uh, those include uh, singletons, so elderly who live, who live alone. Um, so this is very, very important that we empower, you know, our partners who are sometimes very grassroots organizations, but then they really know what's happening on the ground. So that's about uh, empowerment. Uh, last but not least, it is about creativity, right? It is not just the material side. Uh, in, for, uh, you know, one big example that we quote here uh, is, a, is a commitment of 5.5 uh, million US dollar. So basically, schools are all closed and students, they, they go home, they, they learn, learn from home. Uh, all of them now go online uh, to learn. Now, of course, even on the content side, I think there is still a lot for many schools to catch up on the, on the curriculum. Uh, but even without going to content side, you know, when it comes to access, a lot of the grassroots students, they don't have broadband uh, at home. They don't really have the Wi-Fi support. And when it comes to data plan, you know, they, they use their parents' data plan, but the parents' data plan are generally very limited uh, in, uh, in size. It doesn't support enough uh, for the online learning. So uh, in view of this, uh, the charity stress very, very quickly, we convene uh, all four mobile carriers in Hong Kong. We call them, we talk to them one by one. Uh, and then we also uh, get together two NGOs, uh, and then we have government support, the Education Bureau. You know, I talked to the secretary myself. So all together, we very quickly, in two, three weeks' time, we put together a package whereby we offer uh, over 100,000 free data plans, 30 gigs a month, that would be sufficient uh, for the school learning, but uh, insufficient for, you know, gaming for 24 hours. Uh, so that has been uh, very, very well received. Uh, out of the thousand primary and secondary schools in Hong Kong, within a week, uh, over 700 of them sign up for the 100,000 K, uh, 100,000 students uh, free data plan. So it is now already in action. So we are facilitating this uh, e-learning for four months, uh, all the way until uh, mid-July. So these sort of creativity and proactiveness uh, beyond money, right? When we think about NGOs, when we think about foundations, we have to think about also, you know, money is one thing, but you have to also think about beyond uh, the money side. So I guess uh, that's sort of what we have done in the last uh, two, three months. Uh, next slide, please. There are six lessons, but I'll try to be very quick on, on these six lessons. Uh, after all, I'm not a professor. Uh, so next slide, please, George. So in one slide, we capture four of them. Uh, I, I mentioned some of that already before, you know, speed over perfection, uh, empowerment, empower the grassroots organizations, and thinking beyond money, thinking beyond money. Uh, and then I think specifically for us, and for I think a lot of hopefully uh, listening in, uh, if you're from business, or if you're from institutions, academic institutions, whatever, you know, don't forget there is a big corporate expertise and network behind. There is facility management, there's procurements, uh, there's legal uh, and, and, and et cetera. There's even uh, human resources. All these uh, we can bear. We can come, you know, use them, leverage them to help uh, the NGOs or to help the directly the vulnerable communities. So, so do think about not just what you oneself can do. Also think about, you know, the corporation uh, or the institution behind. Next slide, please. I guess then we can sort of allow us to have a little bit of uh, 
luxury to think longer term. Or I would argue even when we're doing the immediate relief, thinking longer term already help us. Uh, you know, um, we, will, we will foresee a prolonged business impact. So what does it mean to the community? And what can we start doing right now? For the nonprofit organizations, a lot of them are losing revenue streams. School, schools are closed. Uh, youth centers, elderly centers, they're closed. Uh, so the self-finance uh, NGOs find it very difficult these days to generate revenue. Obviously, as businesses are hit, the donors, uh, they're not as eager as before. So how, how, does, how, do they, or how does this whole sector survive this storm uh, like other business? Uh, so that's, that remains a challenge. Uh, and, and also the extent of school closure, uh, that pushes us to thinking about the new normal, right? the online learning, the content, the curriculum, and even how do we exercise from home? Right? We don't want all of our kids uh, after four months uh, then lose the interest uh, or, or you know, turn the behavior of not exercising. And there's a lot of interrupt, interruptions uh, in, in the social services as well, you know, hot meal deliveries. So all these things, I think, required uh, new thinking. It is beyond just uh, makeshift, you know, let's survive these two months, but require a lot of new thinking. Right? What if the COVID-19 challenge doesn't go away in six to nine months? What if we will be living in an environment where we have to switch on and switch off social distancing? you know, uh, as cases rise or drop. So how do we then build a more robust infrastructure and technic a technically more savvy system to support uh, a very uncertain future? I think those are the challenge uh, to us. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and then thinking even longer term, then we need to start thinking about what are the institutions or infrastructures uh, that we should uh, bu be building now uh, to avoid or to better manage the future shocks. Uh, how do we strengthen media literacy? There are a lot of fake news floating around uh, these days, creating unnecessary panic. So how do we build trust, solidarity? How do we build you know, people to be more savvy uh, in, in selecting uh, media literacy? And last but not least, how do we invest in big data and technology platforms for good, not for uh, IPOs and not for uh, super wealth uh, in a short time for very, very few stakeholders, but technology for good, for community, for the society. So how do we do that? How do we generate enough motivation and incentive for the brightest and smartest in technology to think about that their technology can actually help human being uh, instead of just making money for few people? Next slide, please. So mental well-being is definitely one of the key areas. Uh, and I would like to just very quickly share two examples with you uh, on what we, what, we, what we have been doing and what we will be doing going forward. So uh, one case on JC Joy Age, this is um, mostly for elderly population, 65 or above. Uh, open up, this is for youth. So we try to cover both, both uh, age groups. So next slide, please. So JC Joy Age, it is a close to 50 million uh, US dollar investment since 2017. We just, uh, in fact, uh, closed off our phase one uh, study. So phase one, uh, there are 18 districts in Hong Kong. Phase one, we piloted that uh, in four districts. And then phase two, which we just started, uh, unfortunately, we're experiencing some delay now because of COVID-19. But in the planning, we will try to use the next four years to really uh, expand the, the, the pilot the success, uh, the successful pilot phase into the other 14 districts in Hong Kong. So all 18 districts in Hong Kong will be covered uh, after the, this program, uh, which will run for seven years. Uh, next slide, please. And in this program, what we really want to do is this. Now, historically, Hong Kong already has um, sort of these re, uh, district-based uh, mental wellness center. These mental wellness centers, they have very professional practitioners. They offer intensive, intensive individual therapies. Uh, but there's a lack of support uh, at, the, at the bottom of the pyramid, which is more community-based, mass-based, but this, this serve, they, they serve a purpose of prevention, uh, but they also should serve a purpose of you know, uh, recovery from, uh, from sort of more intensive uh, intervention requirement. But we didn't have that before. 
So what we had, what we did have, was a large base of community centers in the in the districts, but they are not equipped with capabilities. They don't know how to deal with mental wellness issues. And we have a very limited number of high quality professional practitioners, but then they're running short of reach uh, and they can only deal with so many cases. Uh, so, so this program in particular is really to build a bridge between these two. So we try to train uh, the bottom level, the wider community reach, so that they are equipped a little bit better uh, they can deal with some prevention and some early intervention. Uh, and then at the top, uh, on, the, on the high intensity individual therapy side, they also feel more comfortable now that they can then uh, sort of um, uh, you know, pass their case sometimes uh, to the lower level. And they believe that the lower level is now well equipped to handle those cases. To, so to build an ecosystem in the community and increase the community's capacity to, um, to handle uh, people, uh, elderly people with a mental challenge. Right, next slide, please. So very quickly, I'll just give you the result. Uh, we don't have time to go through the whole program, uh, but the result is very significant uh, from phase one. We are seeing very significant clinical outcomes, and we're also seeing very, uh, very significant uh, uh, SROI, so social return on investment. So just very quickly, you know, we train over 200 young olds. Uh, these are uh, aged sort of 55 or 50 to 65. Each of them would join the program for over 100 hours. Uh, and then they've, they've been trained as peer supporters. And they have already conducted more than 100,000 outreach and engagement sessions. And directly, the service in the last three years, we serve uh, over 4,300 at risk and depressed elderly. Uh, and, and, and among these uh, service groups, 82% show reduction on symptoms of depression uh, at discharge. And then also in the meantime, we try to build the capacity of the whole system. So over 2,000 uh, social workers, they receive training. Uh, and then also 21 project social workers completed a very intensive 256 hours training. So if you look at the two graphs uh, very quickly, uh, these are all clinical results uh, on, the, on the left side. Very, very clearly, uh, this particular group, 4,300, they perform much better than the control group uh, in, in the dimensions of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. And also if we think about the money that we put into the program, uh, and then therefore, if you calculate the money saved that you know um, the, the recovery side that they then use less of the hospital authorities the public resources uh, you know the, the saving uh, even as of October uh, 2019 is already at 1.43 uh, we expect if actually a, a above two uh, SROI after the whole project completion so that's uh, in a nutshell what we've been doing uh, and hopefully can can even scale up uh, on the program for elderly side uh, of the mental challenge. Next slide, please. So, so next one is is really my my own pet project. Uh, it's called Open Up. Um, so, uh, so it's the funding of uh, close to eight million US dollar. You know, I think um, this you know basically I called it the first I think uh, online twenty four seven platform. And we're on Facebook, we're on WhatsApp, SMS, MMS, WeChat. Uh, you name it. We're on multiple channels. So basically, the idea came from. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea came from. We we saw a huge challenge uh, in Hong Kong even a few years ago. I think this is more a global phenomenon now. A lot of the uh, young people they they are facing with a huge challenge on depression, anxiety. Uh, now. Back in 2016, I, I asked about 20 operators on hotline operation to come into my office, and we said, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge. How can we help you? Well, a lot of them raised questions about can we add more volunteers? Can we add more hotlines? Can we um, do more in public education? So we we immediately approved uh, four or five million US dollar, if I remember correctly, to support all of them to increase on those capacities. Uh, but then I also asked them this question. I said, well, you know what? Are young people still using call services? Right? Then the data is very striking. Because back in the 90s, uh, about 30% of the hotline phone, telephone hotline users are age 25 or below. But in recent years, age 35, uh, 25 or below, young people using hotline, they drop below 5%. But I think we can all understand uh, people now use social media. 
they don't really talk to people. They use text, they use social media. Uh, but then the, the, the question you know, that we had at the time was, there's no operator in the room who operates on social media platform. We're losing touch with the younger generation. You know, the way they seek help or the way they try to express themselves are different from the traditional way of offering help. So next slide, please. So therefore, it took us about two years to develop this platform. We launched in 2018 uh, with the following features. It is 24-7, uh, and we try to basically be on all the major social media platforms. Uh, we try to target both at-risk youth and try to also be a gatekeeper, meaning try to do a little bit of prevention. We think about efficient use of staff and management operations. So even from the operation side, we try to make it you know, a, a lot more te te technologically enhanced than traditional phone lines, whereby you have to go to a center, volunteer attached to a phone. Uh, now, we, we, as much as possible, we can even allow, you know, once you serve enough hours, we can allow uh, people to work from home uh, to, to serve as volunteers, but then still with real-time uh, coaching from, uh, from the professionals. Uh, we try to also develop an effective intervention model, a protocol, uh, through this exercise. And very importantly, I think the last uh, one is really because it's all online, it is verbatim record of all the, all the counseling sessions, first of its kind globally, I think, uh, even for counseling, we have very robust data, real time. Right? So how do we do data analytic on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? And then that would further uh, empower the, the, the volunteers and the practitioners to continuously improve our service protocol to help even uh, better uh, than the, the, the people who are in need. Next slide, please. So the response so far is very, very encouraging. We have, uh, since October 2018, we have served uh, close to 35,000 cases, and this includes about 2,000 classified as high risk and crisis. So I'll give you a quick example. You know, a 14 year old girl uh, type in, uh, first line she said, I want to die. So counselor tried to chat her up uh, and then ask her, uh, have you ever hurt yourself? Uh, this lady, young lady said, yeah, I just cut open my wrist and blood is now dripping everywhere. Right. Uh, so the counselor is under tremendous pressure. You had to gain trust, but you want to save life. So in this case, very fortunately, uh, the counselor were able to, to really open up uh, this young lady. Young lady then subsequently uh, you know, um, share her address with us. We call ambulance and save, uh, save that life. Uh, and in March, uh, particularly given COVID-19, what we're seeing is we, uh, we see a almost close to 30% increase in the traffic uh, in valid cases in March 2020. So overall, we have offered close to 180,000 uh, online counseling sessions. Each session lasts for about 50 minutes. We also have a, um, a post counseling session survey. We ask how help seekers, uh, roughly 5% of them fill out that survey. But out of that, 91% said uh, they found it very useful, uh, helpful, and 86% and are willing to seek help uh, in the future. You know, I think these are the sort of infrastructure and institutions that we need to build uh, in the new normal uh, to, to help the community with technology. Right, so next slide, please. That will be my last slide. And just, uh, you know, hopefully we all stay safe, stay healthy, and very importantly, stay happy. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. I think um, we have enough time for one or two questions. Um, let me go through the list. Um, so, um, Professor Chu, you rejoin us already, I see that. Um, so, the first question addressed to Professor Chu, I've got a few of them uh, asking similar questions. Let me try to summarize it. Um, Sorry, Josh, can I hear you? Hey, you seen guys yeah. all mad. Oh, uh, George, I think you sounded fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, see why so, can you not hear him? Yeah. Okay. 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 Let me try to summarize um, uh, a question from our um, audience. Ping Wing Chen um, said, 
it's not sure how happiness can be achieved in terms of economic growth. Um, health and spirit seems to be more related. What's your comment on it, uh, Professor Chiu? Uh, yes, I think uh, there are now good data showing that uh, money do not buy happiness. So, to, uh, uh, and uh, uh, what is more interesting is that uh, as economic growth in a country uh, increases, while people are more concerned about meaning, uh, meaning in life than happiness. So, to, when people are still like living in subsistence economy, having more money may buy them some happiness. But at a point, when we reach a certain point of economic growth, money does not really like to give happiness anymore. And people are now looking for meaning in life, uh, what's purpose in life, uh, and so on. So, um, I agree with this general comment. And that's why I think to, what uh, we would like to do uh, is to see that uh, while we are building a sustainable culture, uh, that uh, will support like uh, uh, happiness, the pursuit of happiness in the economically advanced country. Right. I, I think I've seen similar research. I'm not an academic myself, but I think I've seen similar research uh, which talks about, uh, like Professor Xu said, the diminishing utility of money uh, in terms of um, happiness. So mm. there are certain threshold you need to hit. Uh, before that threshold, I think the, the basic economic means are still very important. But after, after that threshold, other factors might come in. Now, in our data from OpenUp uh, that, that I can share is, uh, if you look at OpenUp and look at uh, how we categorize uh, risk, uh, you know, then you see relationship always being on top uh, of the list. So even today with COVID-19, or a few months ago with uh, quite a bit of social uh, unrest in the society, relationship still, counted as number one factor for disturbance, emotional disturbance, right? Uh, the social unrest, uh, the COVID-19, they always come up at, at those times to maybe top three, top five, uh, but people are generally more disturbed uh, by relationships. So I think that that sets a lot about how we then need to build infrastructure uh, to help you know, family relationship, to help how uh, that's the self-awareness, to help people be more mindful you know, about who they are, uh, their own identity, uh, and building more confidence uh, in sort of their, their own life. So I think these things, whatever the external environment might be, uh, you know, the, the current challenge might be, uh, we need to invest in the very fundamental, uh, these sort of family values, people to people relationships. Yeah, uh, Josh, you may, I may add uh, a couple of comments. So what uh, uh, research have shown us is that uh, uh, to really like achieve happiness, people need to feel that uh, they're being accepted by others and they are, are competent in achieving their goal and they live in a predictable environment. I think this really provides a context for understanding the, uh, the good work that Hong Kong Jockey Club is doing. They're trying to build mm, connectedness among the uh, youth. Uh, they are trying to make the, our elderly feel that uh, they are competent and uh, they are living in a predictable world despite uh, the infection that we all have to manage these days. Okay, um, thanks. Um, I've just got another question. Um, do you propose a going back on globalization to achieve human well-being? I guess both of you can uh, comment on this or answer this. Uh, I, I can go first. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, I think that we are seeing some very interesting global trends in our economic development. Well, um, as economic uh, uh, globalization proceeds, we see that uh, we are now dealing with a much more complex world that requires a lot of like coordination between nations and between citizens within a nation. So, to, uh, uh, but uh, individualism will actually help uh, a lot in economic development. For example, individualism is associated with higher level creativity, a higher level entrepreneurship. So what uh, I think we are moving toward is uh, the development of a kind of model that is uh, more like socially responsible individualism. That is, individuals should have the, the capability to pursue their own goal. But at the same time, they should be, uh, we, we also try to like, to, uh, like nurture values that uh, uh, would increase social responsibility of nations as well as individuals. So I think this is 
uh, something that uh, I think a lot of people uh, are doing. And uh, uh, and I, I hope that uh, by building this kind of like uh, uh, socially responsible citizenship, uh, both at the individual level and at the national level, will help us like to address the coordination problem better in an increasingly complex world. So I'm not saying that we should go back to uh, uh, to the earlier day. In fact, we should uh, try to be more creative to find ways uh, that will help individuals as well as nation to as achieve their goals, uh, national goals and individual goals, but at the same time, uh, think collectively and post-socially. And I think to, uh, 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 the, the, the activities and also the programs that uh, we heard from uh, Mr. Zhang just now are helping us to think into that direction. Right. Um, to me, I think um, I, I'm not sure if globalization is sort of the suspect to blame. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Although I understand some politicians might think it that way and um, you know try to build their own political base in, in their respective jurisdictions. Uh, but if you think about even this COVID-19, uh, do we have that because of globalization? You know, globalization may, in certain way, you can argue, um, you know, help it spread faster than, say, 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu. Uh, but then, in the meantime, globalization helped us share data very quickly. Right? The, the scientists are now mapping the, the, the genome of the COVID-19 very, very quickly in record time. We are now doing uh, experience sharing right, very, very quickly uh, around the world. Uh, so yes, uh, you know the, the virus did spread because of traffic, because of human flow, very very quickly. But knowledge also travel very very fast, uh, and mitigation measures and the way we can cope with it, the and the best practices uh, and the vaccines developments. These are all collaboration among you know, global globally different labs uh, and also protective gears, uh, medical supplies, everything. So I think um, you know globalization helped us also you know come to the problem and solve the problem rather quickly as well. And I think there are a few things beyond uh, COVID-19 without globalization, without you know an entity like UN, uh, it's it's just impossible. Right? Think about climate change. Right? This is global. We can't say you know I live in a bubble of this uh, physical imaginary country city boundary uh, therefore i can do whatever i want and, and i dump everything into the ocean uh, because whatever you dump into the ocean even on the other side of the planet uh, it will have an impact right so so i think you know globalization today we that's what we are living in it's a reality you know i, I don't personally think it is the reason of uh, this particular challenge or, or or any sort of but you know it's just given this reality we also need to learn to then appreciate each other and respect each other uh, and then learn to work together uh, in this kind of framework yeah okay so um thank you so much um, i really want to continue this for another hour or so too but we're really running out of time um so let me um now, um, so thank you everyone for attending today's uh, webinar, COVID-19 Globalization and Philanthropy. Now, we received a lot of questions, but unfortunately, we cannot answer them one by one. If you do still have other questions and you want the, the uh, presenter to address them, please uh, feel free to contact us at um, SDSN Hong Kong at hkjc.org g.hk or sdsn at cdhk.edu.hk. Now, once you leave today's um, webinar, although we really want you to stay, we've got 24 hours program lined it up. Um, you will receive a survey on the entire event, and we would really appreciate if you complete that and provide your feedback to us. Now, video recording of today's event will be available on SDSN's YouTube page in the coming days. Um, on behalf of SDS in Hong Kong and our presenter, uh, Mr. Chen and Professor Chiu, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of today. Uh, I will now pass the time back to Elena. Thank you.
Thank you so much, George and Liang and CY. That was a very engaging presentation. And we thank you so much for your time and getting us started off strong.